Welcome to Call and Response. Uh, I'm Baron. I'm open, Mike Eagle. You only said one of your names. I did. I was you tried, see, you tried to, you tried to get trying me to again. See if you were going to do the pattern, if you were going to stick with mm -hmm. me, nope. or if you were going to march to the, 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 the tune, the beat of your own beat maker. I, I am neither open nor Mike nor Eagle alone. I have, oh, okay. to, I have to say uh, at least together. two of At least two. I can't say just one. That doesn't That's represent true. me well. And there's not a lot of Barons out there. There's not a lot true. of Barons. I've met one other Baron for my entire life at a Los Angeles Clippers game when Baron Davis was still on the team. So it was three of y'all in the building at the same time, or you it just meant a, it was you and Baron Davis? No, no, no. A different Baron. Okay. <laughs> Baron Davis was on the court. Right. I don't know Baron Davis, but he's the only famous Baron out there besides me. I'm semi famous. But but he's were great. there any like famous barons that are actually like landowners like you know what i mean like like the actual title baron any famous ones of those wow i don't know actually i haven't looked into it that much i mean you're right it was a it was a title so that implied that you own some land i forget what culture that is that was like some european shit yeah i think it was medieval <laughs> but uh um there was also a pizza brand named baron something i used to eat a lot when i was a kid but, but that's I don't two remember. r's oh was that two r's There's on the two baron? r's okay same with the SAT prep kits. Barons. Okay, see. See, I don't even know nothing about that. You you, you always school me on so much. You always know a bunch of stuff, and then you say it, and then so then I know it, because that's how learning works. That is true. It, and I just want to say that's also the uh, the president's son. That's a 2R. Yeah, Baron. yeah. So when people go, oh, Baron, like, the like no. I'm like, no, you can hear the difference. Yeah, you know, I don't like, you know, I don't. R. I always feel weird talking about him or thinking about him or seeing any news about him because. Why is that? Because uh, because he's a Trump, my whole body wants to hate him on 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 sight or sound. Like my that's the way that I've trained my brain. Yeah. But he's a child. <laughs> as far as mm -hmm. I know, he hasn't done anything <laughs> to anybody. But I have that cognitive dissonance that happens when when he's brought up. You know. Well, there's the argument to be made that Trump is the way he is because of the way he was raised. So if anything, I feel for that child. I hear that. And I, I, it's too early for me to judge him right. because I don't know who he's going to be yet. And if, right. he's, if he's ever going to escape, <laughs> you know, the clutches of his family name and that's real because like when when you take the time to actually process it and think about it like a human being yeah that's exactly uh where you should come to but i have these instant reptilian reactions sometimes mm -hmm. that that make me hate a child <laughs> you want to hear the weirdest thing ever i'm going to tell you the weirdest darkest factoid i fucking know it's the okay. weirdest shit okay. ever i tried to make a stand-up comedy joke out of this shit and it never worked okay. <laughs> because it's just so weird that nobody could find it in themselves to laugh in any kind of way. And please, viewers, fact check me. Please fact check me. I want to know the facts. Adolf Hitler, okay, had a brother mm. who left Germany before Hitler came to power. Right? He saw the writing on the wall and he's like, I got to get the fuck out of here. And he blackmailed his half brother Adolf, gave him money, a couple hundred thousand dollars, which was a lot at that time. He came to the States before the war started, right? Yeah. The war starts. This guy signs up for the war. His last name is Hitler. He signs up to be an American soldier and fights against his own brother in the American war as an American soldier, mm. right? Survives comes back to the United States, has two kids that are named Hitler. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> and they grow up in Long Island. And by the way, he changed his last name. I was about to say there should be a name change in there somewhere. He did. My joke was that he changed his last name. And I would like to have been someone who drove down that street and been like, didn't that say Hitler yesterday? Oh, okay. Maybe I, my mind's playing tricks on me. I, it says Hiller now. That's easy to uh, it's easy to confuse, right? Anyway, here's your mail. 
but that's not everyone was like yeah 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 but what what about these living relatives right yeah i i, I started thinking about how they talk about jesus having secret children and all the conspiracy theories he web conspiracy theory websites i used to go on uh well, that's, years ago that's a long long time ago that's hard to be like oh there's evidence and documentation but this stuff is supposed to have all documentation i saw the documentary this is why i know this the oh, documentary wow. and documentation both start with doc and i was like what's up so <laughs> wow i wow. know two kids who don't know that they are related to adolf hitler find out on their father's deathbed he goes by the way we're hitlers <laughs> he dies they make a pact to never have children so that their bloodline dies with them the end that's, that's just it. a little fun factoid wow. about people who found out they're related to a mass genocidal monster and were like oh we shouldn't make any more of us and uh, wow. that's what they did one bad apple huh that is really different than what I wanted to talk about, which was the music of Willie Hutch. <laughs> That's what I said before. I'm sure we went there's on. a there's a link somewhere. I'm, Let's I'm talk sure about the music of Willie Hutch because um, I've been listening to Willie Hutch. We're just talking about Willie Hutch because I've been listening to the the, the uh, Last Dragon soundtrack a lot. I like it when you educate though, because I feel like mm -hmm. um, at least one of our guests is going to be very educational uh, for me today, and and maybe more than one because. Um, you know, we're going to learn about a subculture. Well, I'm going to learn about a subculture that I don't know that much about. Yeah. Specifically with our first guest. Not that I'm trying to rush an introduction to anything. But... No, no, no. But you definitely need to. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, I'm going to find that very educational. I mean, you know, there's there's lots of ways in which this platform has been beneficial to me. And this is going to mm -hmm. be... Um, you know, you one personally. of the first times... Exactly. I actually get to learn about something live on air, you know? absolutely and that's the thing like how are you supposed to know what you don't know exactly. so it's kind of like we're ig ignorant is different than hateful <laughs> i guess you could say so but you know i do know a little bit about this culture um but you know we belong to subcultures you exactly know? you are a hip-hop performer i'm a comedian and there are things in our cultures there's knowledge i could drop about comedy and and things that i would say that you would not get and same with you in the, the scene in hip-hop right mm -hmm, mm -hmm, where you have course. to be in that scene to understand it so that that kind of brings us to our first performer because um he belongs to a, a quote-unquote subculture i he, i hate even saying that word why sounds, are you saying the word weird. subculture because it's just a culture it's not under anything sub is under that's what sub means yeah it's like, but oh, it... it's under culture it's like it just is it's a culture you but it, I mean? it's but it's it's a it's a smaller culture within the larger culture we all live in you know what i mean like you wouldn't call you wouldn't call um you wouldn't call having a cell phone a subculture <laughs> you know what i mean because most of us do you know well, but when people had those like those kick the phones that was yeah. culture <laughs> exactly Exactly. Specific. Boost Mobile, that's a fucking subculture. So, okay. you know, we're not speaking to the quality of the culture at all. No. Just just stating that it's it's a uh, it's okay. something that not everybody knows about. Yes, you know? that's very true. That is very true. And now we would like to introduce our first uh uh, uh guest here on Call and Response today. Uh please welcome uh uh somebody from the House of Ebony. The legendary House Ooh. of Ebony. The legendary Shiny. iconic legendary, iconic. iconic House of Ebony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? How you what's doing, Shy? <clears throat> I'm good. How you doing, Brian? How you doing? Um, am I saying it right? No, Baron. I'm Baron. I'm sorry, Baron. That's okay. I didn't mean to say Brian. I'm sorry. And no, it's all right. right. All right. I'm good. How how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Chilling. You know, trying to stay out to eat. <laughs> I hear that. Where uh, where are you? Uh, what 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 part of the of the country are you are you falling in from right now? I am in the United States of America. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm in New York, yo. I'm in New York. Okay, I'm from Harlem. Cool. I'm from Harlem. And uh, New York is one of the, you know, one of the major hubs of, of, of ball cultures. It's mostly around the East Coast, at least according to the little research I was able to do. Um, and when we introduced you, you know, we said House of Ebony, but we made sure to say Legendary because that really specifically means something inside of yeah. ball culture. So what, is, what does Legendary mean to you? Well... Actually, the House of Ebony is actually the iconic House iconic of Ebony. We're, house. we're iconic. We're not even legendary anymore. Um, because 
you know, after legendary, then you got to become iconic. So, um, but legendary is someone who paid the way, who actually like, you know, showed you the ropes, like whoever, like I'm before you, you know, you get what I'm saying? Like, yeah. so you have to like pay homage. So it's like, if you're legendary, you're just a bad year. That's what's up. And what does yeah. that mean to pay homage? What does that mean? Like, I am before you. Like, how does that, how does that work? If you will. How does that work? Like, well, in the Baldwin community, how it works is like, hmm always giving them their roses like when they when they're walking the ball like you know showing them love like or say if i walk say if that person's legendary in my category i will be like well people who was before me such and such like ken uh ken valentiaga all that other stuff they paid the way for me to become who i like become who i am and more them like you know open the doors that i can like walk realness with a twist and stuff like that so yeah how did how did that exactly how did you first get involved with ballroom culture? Um, I got involved in ballroom culture. I was a little curious little boy, you know. You know. <laughs> and then I just went to I went to um I went to the village and when I went to the village I had met these these friends and when I met these the pe these people, they took me to this place called the Bronx Center. Once they took me to the Bronx Center, I was just like, What is going on? You know, like what is all this thing? Like why are they dressing up, why they got makeup on, why they doing dips and stuff like that, because it's not called a death drop, it's called a death. So why are they dipping, <laughs> why are they catwalking and stuff like that? So it was just it was just crazy. And I saw guys like me that's like they look heterosexual, you get what I'm saying? But they actually cutting up, they're feminine up. So it was just like they took me there and it was just like I went to my first ball and it was like, oh do you want to be an ebony? I was like, what's an ebony? Do you want to be unbothered, which is the kiki scene? Um it's a kiki scene in the uh, main scene ball. So I was like, sure, why not? And ever since then, I was just in the ballroom scene. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, well, I'm you know, you, you, you keep talking. You, you, threw some, you threw some terms out there <laughs> yeah, you that, that, that you're real familiar with and I don't know nothing about, but I want you to, I want okay. you to explain. It's like, Kiki, what is, what's the kiki scene? What is that? All right, now, I'm legendary in the kiki scene. You get what I'm saying? Now, the kiki scene is like, think of it as a as a baseball team you okay. have your minor lead and then you got your major lead mm -hmm. now the minor lead is where uh 16 17 year olds really don't have uh really don't know what like what to do in this in this gay society you get what i'm saying and they just happen to just meet people that's just like them mm -hmm. you get what i'm saying and that happens to be in the kiki scene the kiki scene is a whole bunch of fun it's you can express yourself however you want i mean you can do that in the major ballroom scene also um but it's a little harsh. You get what mm -hmm. I'm saying? It's a little, you know, you have to be on point. You have to have faith. You have to be, do all of that. And the kiki scene, it's a little leeway. Like, you know, in baseball, uh, when the little boy hit the bat, he could run this way and they'd be like, oh, it's okay. You get right, what I'm saying? Right. And make him run that way. No, that's okay. You get, you get what I'm saying? In the kiki scene, now in the major scene, you can't do that. You know what I'm saying? You have to walk, run the right way. So that's kind of like how it is, the kiki scene. Yeah, gotcha. in, the, in the main scene. So in the Kiki scene, there's room to grow and develop your your act and your character, and then you graduate mm -hmm. up to the main scene. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Basically, just like that. Yeah. And I would say style as well, right? And your style, yeah. Like I say, if like you don't have that much style, you can learn from these people in the Kiki scene. And once you learn from these people, um, it don't even have to be a legend. You get what I'm saying? You can just learn from anybody because it's like everybody's very creative. Um, and the uh, Bumstein. So yeah, it's just all about that. And what are the things when you talk about learning in that scene? What are the things that somebody would learn? Well, definitely learn how to have tough skin. You have to have mm. tough skin in the bomb scene. You cannot be no punk in the um in the uh in the scene because you always gonna sometimes you can get chopped, people tell you no, all this other stuff, people will read you. Like, mm -hmm. oh my God, look at her hair. You get what I'm saying? Right, oh right, my right. God. Um, he rolled in like he got two left feet. Like, you just got to have tough skin. Um, so, but the things that you can learn is like learning how to self face, learning how to catwalk, learning how to duck walk, learning how to bug, period. Because um, if you're going to walk the category, you have to actually just learn the category. You can't just go out there looking crazy. You know what I'm saying? So, you just got to learn from other people and watch. You, you were saying a second ago how like people find their way into the community. Um, you know, they might be, they might not even know it's there, but they kind of stumble upon it and get brought in. Uh, and it seems like with just how, th how harsh things can be in the real world, it's so important to find this community to belong to. 
Uh, and within that, like, how important is it to like have a house bring you in? Well, it's very important, especially like if you like somebody new. Like, I feel like you should definitely go around and see what house fits you. Don't say, hey, don't meet, don't like say for instance, don't meet me and say, I'm going to tell you, hey, come to Ebony. And then like, I tell you to come to Ebony and you don't really rock with everybody that's around Ebony. You get what I'm saying? So I think that people should just, that's not me, but that's Shorty. That should be me, but all right. Um, <laughs> no, no, I'm just playing. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> Yeah, I just feel like I just feel like what was the question again? I'm sorry. I was just like, saying. Uh, I, I was just saying how important it is it is it to belong to a house, especially because the outside oh, yeah. world can be kind of harsh. You know what I mean? Yeah, so it's very important. I feel like if you need support, uh, it don't matter if it's financial. It don't matter if whatever it is. Like if you need help, the family is there for you, especially on the floor. Also, like you will want to hear the name, and when you're walking, you want to hear your name scream you know mm. your house you get what i'm saying you want mm -hmm. that impact you want to feel that you want to feel fab you get what i'm saying because i mean if you don't have nobody behind you then you just like it's a little boring you get what i'm saying but you want the people that's that's behind you because once you get the people behind you then the crowd is the after that the crowd is lit mm. now yeah. before i said that all of us are kind of members of different subcultures right and mm -hmm. You know, Mike is all of us are different are members of different soul cultures that have their roots in protest, you know, that have their roots in in uh, proclaiming our right to exist, you know, hip hop, comedy and, you know, the, the ballroom scene. So and we've all seen our scenes kind of become mainstream. Hip hop has become very huge. Comedy is very huge. And now these things, because of shows like Pose and shows like Legendary, um, people are starting to know more about this but they don't necessarily know the roots in the protest. And I guess what I'm trying to ask is, considering all of that, I guess like, how is it that you would say that existing in this scene is a protest from just how the world works in general? Okay, um, so you're basically asking me, <laughs> yeah. let's simplify it. You're basically yes. asking me um, what, is, what is Bowman itself like, well, yeah. it's kind of like it's kind of like you live in the world, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And people look at you and they treat you a certain way, right? Correct. Which pushes you to find the place where you can be yourself. Okay, so you're basically asking me, oh, uh, you're basically asking me, do I feel like Bowman should be underground, or do I like the fact that it's actually being brought yes. to the world? Yes, because and, you that, and, do you think that's doing a disservice to the point of that culture, or do you think that it's good for the culture? Okay. Um, hmm. See, I don't because I, I know people feel like the bone bone culture should be underground. But mm -hmm. for me, growing up and me wanted to be like the person I am. Like I want to be a star. You get what I'm saying? I want to be on billboards. I want to. I want to be on TV. You get what I'm saying? So the order in, in order for that to happen, bone has to come from out of their shell and be up on tv they have to do all this other stuff you get what i'm saying like to be recognized as this is a talent too you get what i'm saying this is a form of dance also because i mean when you talk about contemporary dance and jazz yes, and all yes. the other stuff they don't put vogue in it and vogue they is stole from literally it. they and, right and got stolen from it it's literally a whole talent like it's really hard work so for me I feel like it should go worldwide. You get what I'm saying? If it wasn't worldwide, uh, if it wasn't international now, like I mean, I wouldn't be on TV. I wouldn't have the gigs that I do have. I do get. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So I feel like it's really, really dope and it's great exposure. Like I mean, I feel like the show Legendary was really great for me. I don't mm. know if I'm skip uh, continuing, but or just talking. But I feel like the show Legendary was great for me and not Pose is because I wanted to show my authentic Vogue. You get what I'm saying? Mm. I wanted to show how I Vogue. I don't yeah. want to show the world how they used to vogue in 1980. That's not me. You get what I'm saying? So I, Yeah, I just can't help but feel all the similarities to stand-up and hip-hop mm -hmm, and what, mm -hmm. what you're saying. What were you going to ask, Mike? Um, I want to know, like, especially nowadays, because, you know, you, you have your community where y'all support each other, and, you know, people don't know about it, they don't know about it, but y'all rock hard with each other. And uh, but we in a we in a moment right now where especially people in minority communities, you know, black and Latino um, 
are feeling the weight, feeling the outrage of like racial injustice with police brutality and all of that. And I'm wondering, does that find its way into y'all community? Does it find its way into y'all events and like the performances y'all put on and the moves y'all do? Does does any of the rage of you know racial injustice does it does it manifest itself in the ballroom scene? Okay, I want to be really, really, really honest. Um, super, super honest. Yeah. So this is how this is my opinion and how I look at it. This is not everybody else's and the LGBT community, but um, this is how I look at it. When it first happened with the Floyd Floyd situation, yes, I was all about the uh, Black Lives Matter. We all move as one. You get what I'm saying? Yes, I sir. get that, and I do get that. I get I get the fact that I'm black also, and I'm also a part of the LGBT community. But you have to also, and then it was the second thought of, oh, I should go protest. And then it was like, okay, I should go looting. But then I was like, no, I'm not going looting. That's not a good, that's not good. That's not for the cause. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So then now I, and now that I changed my mind to go actually go protest, uh, literally the day, the day uh, that I think about doing that, I see a whole video of our, our black uh, heterosexual men jumping on a transgender woman. Mm. You get what I'm saying? Yes. So yes. you want uh, you want us our, us LGBT Black Latinos to come support, even though I, it sounds it, it's, it's bigger than it, it's bigger than that. But you want us to come support these heterosexual men that's getting killed by these cops. But our trans women and trans our trans sisters and gay males are getting murdered by these yes. heterosexuals that's 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 uh that's getting killed. Yeah, yes. we understand it and we sympathize we sympathize for it. But at the same time, when our trans sisters get killed or when our black men get killed, they never protest for us. It's not yeah. a big it's and, and even if it is a protest for us, it's mainly us LGBT um protesting or the Caucasians protesting with us. Can I follow up with that not, real fast, Ben? Yeah. No, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I thought you I thought you was finished. No, no, let, no, no, let's no, try, I, I, let's try I, I, talk. Okay. Oh yeah, so that's how that's how I feel about it. Like, I mean, I still am for the cause of Black Lives Matter, yes, but I feel like all lives should matter at this at this point. Uh, I feel like the people that say Black Lives Matter, that's really Black Lives Matter, should literally open their eyes to say that. Well, what about the LGBT community also? Yes. Because I don't think that they, I don't think that they are. Um, and that's kind of fucked up that we have to be separated. But it is what it is. Like, it is no shade. Like, I think that's so because, real. I think that's it's, so real. It's no, it's no, it's no shade. Like that's why we don't really fuck with the heterosexual. Like we fuck with y'all, but it's, it doesn't be like, oh yeah, that's my bro, that's my bro, that's my bro. Because I know at the end of the day, if I die the next day, you want to come march with me. Mm. You get it's stuff like that. So yeah, that's real. I'm so glad you no, said man, that, so and I'm so glad you said happy. it yes. the way you said it. Yes, because I think that that represents a real sense of the outrage I'm talking about. And we're talking, you know, a lot of people are talking about the outrage for the George Floyd situation, but we do know we are aware of situations where it's been transgender women has been murdered, uh, black yes. homosexual men has been murdered, and it doesn't get the same amount of outrage. It doesn't get the same amount of reverence. It doesn't get the same amount of marching. So I'm really glad you said that the way you said it. And, um, yeah. you know, I want to know from your perspective, what can we do to make sure that those incidents get treated with the same amount of attention? Um, I just feel like they, I feel like they should pay more attention. I feel like they pay attention to what they want to pay attention to. I feel like they listen to, they, they do what they want to do. Like, you get what I'm saying? So I feel like it takes, it has to take that, if one of y'all can take that extra mile to a uh, black heterosexual man can be like, oh, I'm going to throw a, a LGBT event, you know, for the LGBTs. That will be like, oh, well, shit, if he can do it and niggas not calling him gay, you get what I'm saying? Right, once, right. Once the heteros that you do anything with the LGBT, they just wind up calling him freaking gay. So that's why I understand, I kind of a little bit understand why heterosexuals be so scared to deal with the um the gays. But at the same time, no, just be a freaking man about the situation. <laughs> like, if you're Seriously. Comfortable in your, if, you, if you're comfortable in your freaking, um your fucking skin, then like, why do you care? Like, you get what I'm saying? Like, Absolutely. I, I tell these people, I tell, um, I have uncles and brothers and all the other stuff. If you're not gay, just be like, yo, bro, I'm good. We be like, okay, that's it. You don't gotta be like, yo, my nigga, I don't fuck with that shit. That's corny. Yeah, then yeah. that's they when we, that's when we, that's when we start calling you like, yo, you're a corny. Like now it's like, you know, so just stuff like that. Just support. Yeah, yeah. Gay panic, right? It's kind of yeah, like. yeah. It's, right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. 
That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Shy. Were you about to ask something else, Mike? Because I got one more. No, no, no. I'm I'm just I'm just rocking with him and uh, and what yes. he's saying. Go go ahead, yeah. man. Well, Shy, I just want to say on air um, to anybody that knows you that it was at our request that you turned that jersey inside out. That is not what Shy wanted. To do. <laughs> <laughs> it is not what he wanted to do. Yes, it protested. He protested that for so. Like, they better not, they better not read me for, re for wearing this jersey like this. And I said I will make sure that they know that we told we cannot afford because that's a good jersey. It's a dope jersey. Afford, yeah. You know, he it has a brand on it, and we can't afford that. Okay, we um, all week. <laughs> I, that's, that's all I wanted to say. Yes. So, you know, obviously we could talk for longer, and and right. that's we got, we got to go. But call me, <laughs> you know, call me, Mike. We we will put our we will put our money where our mouth is, man. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, we fuck with you. Um, we fuck with you. I appreciate that. If anybody, uh, if y'all don't know what Big O is, down. Uh, can I? Um, yes, please, yeah, plug, plug the virtual bar. Oh, okay, plug it, yeah. please, yeah. Okay. All right. So if anybody know what Big O is, Big O is an app um, where everybody can just talk and that or It's just kind of like Zoom or whatever, but it's called Big O. Um, you have to go to my Facebook, my Instagram, and Shot of Champ right here. Uh, that's my Instagram. My Facebook is my first and last name, but I think you can type in Shot of Champ. Anyway, I'm having a ball on Sunday at 8 o'clock. Sunday, um, what date? Really be... What date? Oh, this Sunday. Say the date, June twenty eighth. Why would you do that? You know, Sunday, like... Sunday, this Sunday. Just because people might not see this right now, they might see it a little later. But Sunday, oh, okay, Sunday. Okay, okay. So this Sunday, June twenty eighth at eight o'clock Eastern, at eight, um, on Eastern time. Oh, yeah, boom, boom, boom. Be there, please. Um, just show support if you want to um donate or anything. I like that. My cash app is shy the champ. S H Y D A champ. Just let me know what the cat what it's for. Put the gay flags or whatever, so I know it's for the ball. Um, and yeah, and I'll give you a shout out. You know, I'm gonna definitely give you a shout out, uh, Baron and oh, um, Mike. You already know. All right, All right. So. appreciate that. Shy we appreciate everybody. you. Appreciate your honesty. Iconic. Thank you. Thank you. Period. I appreciate y'all so much. I appreciate peace. you too. All right. All right. Uh, I think we're gonna what do now. Uh, just stay there. <laughs> Hit the mute. Uh, yes, we're going to go for a little break in a split second. So, yes. Well, uh, one more time, everybody. I can't hear anyone in the world. One more time for Shy, Iconic Absolutely. House of Ebony. Uh, Mike, any Shy. feelings you want to share before we go out to this break? Oh, man, no, that was incredible. I, I was just really glad we got to that last point and, um, and, and we're able to really address and talk about some of that because I think that's real talk that we haven't been having. So I'm, I'm yes. glad, to, glad yes. we got to that. Yes, indeed. Okay, we'll be right back after this nothingness we want this to be the realest of the real you know exactly that's what we're here for we inside the community center we can't pull no punches around here exactly are we going to talk or not you know exactly. um let's not be delicate and i think that our next guest will will follow through with that mantle okay so this is a person that um you know people say corny shit like this is one of my favorite people but this is one of my favorite people and i've known her for a very long time at her way back in atlanta but you know her from the Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Uh, Mike, what do you want to say about this guest coming up? The she's the shit. That's what I want to say. <laughs> he is the shit. Please welcome Dulce Sloan. How you doing, Dulce? Hi, friends. <laughs> How you doing? Hello. Where, where, are you, uh, where are you calling in from? I am calling in from the trash ass city known as New York. Oh. <laughs> I am currently in my crafting corner. I'm sorry? Are you not a fan of New York City? Oh, I hope they burn it down. <laughs> you have to be there but if you had a choice you wouldn't be right listen if the lord ever sees fit to bless me with the dragon mm, I'm burning it <laughs> oh, oh oh you're gonna be a colonizer I was, that's why i was never i was never surprised about no, no 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 listen I, I you know i've been thinking about it i've been talking about it on stage and it's just mm -hmm. like i'm not a monster you know i would let them evacuate first uh <laughs> I don't want the people to get hurt. I just want this place to burn. Yeah. Like, listen, I'm going to start with Staten Island. The only place I'm not going to burn down is Drita DeVanzo's house and <laughs> the mural for Big Ange. Shout out to Big Ange. That's it. <laughs> so I'm guessing, uh, I'm guessing it's been a little challenging for you being a uh, hold up in, in, in New York for the last few months. Uh, your girl's been out here crafting heavy, real heavy. <laughs> What so kind of stuff? Have a corner. You have a whole corner dedicated to it. Right. I got a whole campaign going. Listen, I got a little toaster oven back here for when I make my little shrink plastic and my clay 
but I can't let people see that I got a toaster oven because then niggas will think I'd be snacking in my living room. <laughs> so, but do you be snacking in your living room now? Yeah, but I cook it in the kitchen. I'm not. Oh, okay. I'm like, oh, let me paint something. Also, how is hot pockets doing? I'm not doing it. <laughs> A hot pocket is a work of art in a, in a sense. Um, you oh, know, my brother told me he deep fried a hot pocket one time. Oh. Mm. He said it was never not hot. I'll tell you that. Like after, yeah, no. It was hot <laughs> all day hot. long. Yeah. It I was can't. hot forever. That's uh, too much whatever. fried stuff in one place. Well, Where are you going? Hot. You'll say we're, we're on the air. <laughs> 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 like, she just left. I <laughs> what is before, but I was too busy listening to Shy because Shy was amazing. Yes, but, indeed. Um, so I've been, I thought I was making pretty stuff, but apparently I've been making a uh, drug paraphernalia. So. Oh, is that a, is that a weed tray? Is that what that is? Not originally, no. <laughs> <laughs> not originally. I got trays at the Dollar Tree and some cheap ass nail polish. And I bought a new Cricut machine. And I was like, you know what? Crafting as fuck, right? So I made this for my friend, Danielle. I designed the whole thing. Oh, that's I nice. I assumed that was for Danielle. I don't know what. <laughs> I don't know what tipped me off. <laughs> Right, so this is like four different colors of nail polish, and I got the vinyl cut that That's out. That's very pretty. And you know, made this for my friend Peggy. You know. Oh wow! I mean, I'll take one. I'm saying, five. how much? Hmm? How I'll much one, one of them one of them fancy weed trays go for? Uh, well, I could give you a friend discount. All right, I'm with it. I'm with it. We can talk offline. You know, we also yeah. have to. We also have but, to think uh, about the uh, the occupational hazard of having to go to the post office. And uh, put those things in the mail too. So let us listen. That's been the other thing because, like, during all of this, my mom started making like face masks. Um, mm. and I didn't know when I was talking about this, so I don't have any with me, otherwise, I'd have to get off screen again. Um, I would prefer we're about content, we're about being visible. Uh, <laughs> but she's she made me like four different masks, she buys them pre made, and then she customizes them. So like uh, P.D. Diabru, for him, when he promotes his shows, he has like a cartoon of him as a pigeon. So who is that? She did that. P.D. Diabru, very has, funny New York comic. Just make sure you. Oh, P.D. is hilarious. Give him and a then, give him a uh, give him a shout. Derek Gaines, he uh, his album's called Fuck Boy Brown Zero. Um, I'm not. It's not my. It's not my ministry. But his album. <laughs> so. I designed the logo for him and I sent it to my mom and my mom made him a face mask and a t-shirt and then she also gives you like drawstring bags to uh, put the masks in and now she started doing lanyards because people would lose their masks so she gives so she's been giving people lanyards now like they can connect to the mask like old lady glasses mm -hmm. so if you want to take like if you you know you finally get in your house you take your mask off or whatever or you're talking to somebody you take it to the side or you know, just want to breathe a little bit in between mm -hmm. living your mm -hmm. life. You don't have to worry about it falling off because it's connected to the lane. So oh, that's what okay. we've been doing. Um, okay, Mike. Been, let me yeah. let me let me say let me interrupt you real quick, Dual Say. Mike, w watch as I deftly tie everything that Dual Say's been talking about to the theme of protesting through art. Here we go. Go ahead, Big B. I'm ready. <clears throat> let me do it. Say. <clears throat> Let me go. Okay, here we go. Um, craft. Crafting is art, right? Mm -hmm. um, any art is really in service of a community. The original mm -hmm. art, you could even say cave paintings, uh, were in service of the community to tell the story. Sometimes you could say uh, of the ancestors or how to properly hunt this animal, right? So crafting and art has always been in service of the community. It's always been about the people around you, right? Okay, so... The fact that Dulce and her moms are making masks, making trays for people that they know and love. It's not only practical and useful, which is what kinds of gifts you're supposed to give on one of the nights of Kwanzaa, but it's also in protest of the uh, capitalistic system. Oh, wait. Hey. Because this is barter <clears throat> and trade amongst mm -hmm. the community mm -hmm. who is may i say who is can i get an amen who is amen. supporting each amen. other and is that not a protest in the structures we have all been raised in <laughs> well i can Same. say that i didn't go protest only because <laughs> i i didn't physically protest because okay. i know just how i felt mm-hmm 
I would have burned shit down. Mm. I would have been out there with a table of like masks and Molotov cocktails going, Molotov cocktails, get a free mask, Molotov <laughs> cocktail. In a shopping cart, just pushing it around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just enough, you know, like, you know how when people used to sell like illegal stuff and like, you know, when like on Canal Street, there'd be a lady walking with DVDs and the cops roll up and all of a sudden she's selling fruit. Yeah. Same kind of thing. <laughs> Boom, Molotov, you know. Or I'm just walking with a rolling bag, like I've been shopping, and it was like, hey, Black Lives Matter, <laughs> Molotov cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> because that's how I felt, because it was mm. just like, I've been to, I've been in marches, and it's like, we have been marching for a very long time. I think the thing that's made me so upset with all of this is, one, the white people hitting you up, talking about, what can I do, what can I do, da 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 right, da da, -da. Right. And everyone's like, oh, it just seems like, you know, they care so much now. It's, don't tell me you didn't know. You right. knew. <clears throat> you didn't mm. care. Mm. Don't call me going, don't say, what can I do? Not a, get off my phone. That's mm. true. Because I appreciate, because, you know, I got them good white folks. And um, I've only been getting the, I support you. I love you. I hope you're okay. No one's been hitting me with the, well, I'm not sure. I just feel, what am I? In? No, I haven't gotten any of that, which is I'm very thankful for. But I think people know me well enough to go, don't call me with this nonsense on the phone. Stop it. So you, you say you didn't want to march. It sounded like because, you know, you was, you was too angry to march. I was going to break shit. I was going to flip a police car personally. I was going to set something on fire. I was going to go to Pennsylvania, buy fireworks. I was uh -huh. a fool. I was going to set shit on fire. I was mm. going to provoke. A, like I was going to act a donkey because I just, it's just, I just, it's, I think so many people are out. The, the, uh, speak, breathe <laughs> and speak. I'm so glad people are protesting everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But one thing that caught me off guard is that they were telling us we were protesting in Japan and London and New Zealand, but right. they weren't telling us that there were protests in Kenya and Nigeria mm. and Ghana. They weren't telling us that because you don't want people to think that the people that we are linked to genetically, you want us to think that they don't care about us. Mm. You see what I'm saying? And then I saw somebody commenting like, well, you know, black people don't even know where they're from in Africa. And I'm just like, Right. What point is this? Like, I wonder what happened and made it where you couldn't quite trace your lineage. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. I want, I just, just spitballing here. <laughs> just spitballing. Well, Maybe it's going to prove we didn't want to go on. So, I, I've just been saying this the whole time. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you can't, and I've been saying this on different stuff. The abuser can't look at the victim and go, how do I stop abusing you? Mm. That's not how this works. If I'm in the foundation of the building, I can't at the same time tear it down. Mm. Something outside has to come in and destroy. I, I can't stop. How do we take down a system that we didn't even create and we're trapped in? Because when it comes to mm. civil rights and when it comes to the end of Jim Crow, there was a bunch of white men who passed the bill. The end of slavery, there was a bunch of white men who passed the All of these things, white people had to go to white people and go, we're not doing this shit no more. Mm. So instead of asking us to prove to you that we need to be treated as humans, talk to your fucking dad mm. and your mama. And your uncle. I'm acting like that they are not benefiting mm. from racism. I'm not here for the, well, we're all minorities. No, bitch, you get a sunburn, you were complicit. That chick was standing right next to that dude when they had slavery. She said they were, when Ruby Bridges was desegregating a school, there were white women standing outside with a coffin with a black baby doll in it. Mm. That wasn't white men. That was white women. White women have been, 52% of them voted for Trump. I'm not here for it. Y'all benefited from this entire system. When you look at uh, what was it? The heifer in the park with the dog. Uh, was it Amy Cooper? Or Cooper. Like that? Yes, yeah. that that cow. Her. 
Thank God he was recording her because what did that have to do when she got on the phone? Her voice completely changed. She started acting. She started acting. So you can't tell me you don't know that, that this power. is a system because you knew to change your damn voice when you mm. got on that phone. Mm -hmm. So I'm not playing this game no more. Stop asking us to prove that we're people. Stop asking us to benefit you because what would happen if we did leave? What would happen if all of us got on, so if Oprah and Jay-Z and Beyonce bought a bunch of planes <laughs> and we got the hell up out of here, you know what they would say. Oh my God, I can't believe they left. Why? We did so much for them. Bitch, what are you saying? <laughs> Say, I hate to cut you off. I hate to cut you off. That's also oh. this episode title is now is Bitch, what is bitch, you what saying? Is saying? That's, that's uh, the episode and title. Another t shirt. Um, I'm so sorry to cut you off, Jules. Say, we have to we have to get to some other fantastic guests. This is friends. This is I what I love about you. I love talking with you because you I always got the real shit to say. Over my ego. I miss um, you too, though. Say, thank you so much for that. Thank you for, for giving us your energy that way. We yes, appreciate indeed. it a lot. Thank you. Who knew I could shift so much from crafting to fuck these hoes? <laughs> <laughs> I did. That's why you're here. Thanks <laughs> on everybody. Catch Thank you, Dose. On the Daily Show with Trevor Noah and uh, hit her up for some crafts. Um, okay, right now we are going to bring up uh, another fantastic guest and someone I've also known for a very long time and someone who is also one of my favorite people. I know. I know. Why does he keep saying that? I don't say it all the time, everybody. I had to sing. You certainly you. don't sing it all the time. I, so I do sing this it is all the special. time. Special. Oh, okay. And this well. person knows that. You know that. Please welcome uh, <laughs> to the show. Um, you might know her from uh, Orange Is the New Black, um, which was poised to become the second longest uh, running series on Netflix. But Grace and Frankie had to shut down production because of the pandemic. She's also on a show <laughs> called Miss. America, Mrs. America on Hulu, in which she is playing the legendary Shirley Chisholm. Please welcome my friend and yours, Uzo Aduba. Huh? We are not a monolith. You know, we, we, don't, we, we don't have a single story, and yet our single existence, we are as varied as the hues we come in, right? And so too are our stories, and yet we have been narrowed down and compressed to about two, possibly maybe three, ideas of who we are. And I don't know how an entire continent's worth of people can possibly fit through such a narrow lens as that. And here is Uzo Aduba, everybody. Hello, Uzo. How you doing? Hi. We had to Hi, interrupt Aaron. you with a clip of you before we started. No problem. Yes, yes. No I hope problem, you, open mic, Eagle. No hope problem. you don't mind getting bumped by yourself. Uh, <laughs> First of all, um, Uzo, how are you? What's going on? How you doing? How you feeling about everything? <laughs> um, that's a lot. I am, I'm okay. You know, I'm okay. It depends on the day. It depends on the moment. Depends on um, the fight. Depends on hmm. uh, the charges <laughs> that have been um, imposed. That I'm doing okay, but I'm okay. I feel hopeful. Mm -hmm. I feel um, like I have a lot of questions, mm. um, but I'm okay. I'm mm. okay. Navigating these waters, for sure. Would you mind sharing some of those questions that you have? Yeah, my, <clears throat> my question is um, mostly a why question. You know, why mm. does this keep, keep happening? Yeah. Um, why do we have to still fight? Why don't we have leadership? Why don't we wear a mask? Why aren't <laughs> yeah. we saying their names? Why aren't we arresting Brianna Taylor's killers? Why mm -hmm. are we still fighting this fight? Why do we have to, Dulce said it well, keep proving that we are people? Um, a lot of why questions. Why don't you know this? Or these mm. things. Um, why did it take this much pain for you to hear our pain? Mm. Man, uh, for those why questions, and, and, and it sounds like a lot of them, I'm wondering for you if there's any central answer that kind of pops up. 
I know you're asking the questions because none <clears throat> of us really know. But uh, and you're thinking about it and you're and you're chewing on these things. Does does anything central arise to kind of inform why you think we're in the situation that we're in? Yeah, I mean, history. Um, I think, um, you know, I'll say first, I think the first thing that comes to me is I kind of really am team not making my responsible myself responsible for answering those questions because mm -hmm. those are all questions that I'm placing elsewhere because yeah. I, the truth is I don't have the answer. This is right. not my house. I didn't right. build it. I don't live here. You do. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you have to tell me why you put all this furniture in here and why mm -hmm. you chose to decorate it this way. Why you keep tripping over the same uh, <laughs> lifted sure. up piece of the rug. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Put a weight on it. You know, oh, like right. this. Well, but maybe um, you keep tripping because you swept, you swept so much shit under that rug. Mm -hmm. Well, well. Metaphor. Exactly. Exactly. But I mean, here's that. And that's, and the, but that's, the, but that's the real power of the truth and it, and ignoring an obvious truth. And I think, um, if I can stand outside what I of it and guess is mm -hmm. for a long time, you know, our story, America's story, uh, or history, excuse me, mm -hmm. has been built on stories, storytelling. Yes. And not all of those things have been absolute truths. Um, a lot of those things have kept, I think, both sides in prisons are much, much, much more restrictive and harsher. And literal. Um, and literal. Thank you, Baron. Um, but it, it, has, it has oppressed us and it has kept you from experiencing us and our greatness and the world and our greatness. And so that, that is a, it's a, a form of self-induced victim, vic, victimizing as well. If you, you, you victimized mm -hmm. yourself in a way as well, you know, when you think about all the people that we have um, killed or incarcerated or left behind in terms of edu education or socioeconomics, you think of all of the spirits who were colonized or mm -hmm. enslaved, mm -hmm. you wonder for a second, maybe that's why we have no cure yet for cancer. Mm. You know, maybe that's the reason why we haven't been able to build life yet on Mars. Because all of these, we've all lost mm. in this. You Can know what I mean? A, a, Those a minds. Psychic, psychic baggage. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, you think of when you look at, when you look at like within the prison system, you're some people, not all people, but some of our people who are in there who have, no formal education, no background in chemistry, no background in physics, but yet have managed to figure out how to develop a kite communication system to yeah. fly from cell to cell, have figured out how to, the chemistry for making uh, a moonshine or products in there. And you're like, these are smart, smart individuals and had been given the opportunity and the space and the chance to thrive, right? And that's just one section that I'm talking about. Right. This is what we're able to come up with on our own with no formal education. What could that mind have been, hmm. have done? That's a genius we're talking about then, really. Okay? And then who's had the burdens of life put on them to arrive them in some circumstances to this place. So those are just the things that I think about all the time, like, wow, where would our planet be? What mm. what solutions mm -hmm. to global plant global global warming climate change would we would we have found at this point yeah. had we been free if we were free? So, I it's not for me. Well, I don't I, I don't feel like I need to answer anything. I'm, I I I want that's fantastic. Want their answer. No, I I mm. I, I that I, I co sign on that. Um, I wanted to mm. ask you, kind of considering everything you just said, you know, considering like. I guess it's almost like intergenerational trauma and the, the, the narrative, the storytelling of history are two sides of a coin, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like history is the story that we tell ourselves of what had happened, but intergenerational trauma is what happened regardless of what we tell ourselves that all of us carry in some sort of mm -hmm. way, right? So considering that and storytelling, which is what we all do, we're all storytellers, right? We act and we sing and we 
write jokes and we write songs to express all of these different parts of ourselves, right? So this is considering the whys of how you started this interview. I've yeah. known you for a really long time. So I wanted to ask about this unity of, uh, of all these different arts that I know that you have taken part in, right? Mm -hmm. So we met at Boston University. I believe you were an opera major. Yeah. Yes. Now, I believe correctly. Did you also, uh, <laughs> were you also on the track team? Was that also a correct thing? Wow. Yes. Yes. Okay. And you also. I like that you're posing this as if you don't actually know this. But, yeah, <laughs> like, okay. know. <laughs> like, but, okay. but your sister, you and your sister were both. <laughs> ran track and you ran and you ran track yes. through all high school and it, you ran yep. track through all college yes yes and i would say that that is also an art you know sp sport is an art mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. why opera why track what from those things have you brought into yourself as an actor also mm -hmm. fuse that with the fact that every role that you have done has an intentionality to it you're known for playing um you know you've won awards for playing a role on a show that for a lot of people was the first time that prisoners ever appeared to be human to mm. them. Mm. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Um, yeah. And now you're playing uh, Shirley Chisholm, you know, mm -hmm. who um, a lot of people consider myself an American hero. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah. there's an intentionality to the roles that you choose. And so I go like, okay, there's something that each of these things give her that she takes from each of these things that she gives back to each of them. And I'm curious mm -hmm. if you have anything to say about that observation. Um, okay, working from the top, I would say I picked opera because um, quite honestly, that's how my voice just naturally sang. Hmm. You know, you know there's, I, I believe there's a difference between singing and making sound. I can make sound, make and manipulate sound. And then there's something from, you know, the pinky toe all the way up the gut through the spine that moves you to make music. And that is singing to me. And that is how my voice sang. That's how I felt the most free. Um, mm. There was nothing to do. I didn't have to make my voice sound anyway. That's just how it sang. So, and, and I would say I also picked, so that's how, that's how I began into the opera. And I also didn't have the language skills, skills the vocabulary to know that what I liked about music and singing was actually the story. Mm. I didn't know that that was separate from acting. I just only knew that I liked to sing and I liked the words and I liked the crafting of that with music. So that's how I kind of arrived at that. And I, you know, I came from a sports family. I came into the arts pretty late um, in my life. Like I started doing it, I guess, comparatively. I started doing it in high school. Um, but I had always been in sports. All my siblings did sports. And so I ran track in college because uh, I, I got a scholarship um, to run there. Um, hashtag fire it up to you. And so, um, <laughs> so, so proud to be you. So it's like I went and I did that. And I think how I carry what I carry from both of those into what I do is um, I'm very... I think that my favorite thing from sport, I, I, and I say this and I really, you know, no shade to anybody who's never played a sport, but I hope everybody at some point gets to play a sport, particularly little girls. Um, there is something about being a part of something that is team-based, that it takes like more than yourself to make it work. And like having that understanding of like the the, like it sounds so cliche but like they know i and team you know what i mean but it mm -hmm. is really true sounds like um, theater then, a little bit doesn't it yeah, yeah but like yes but there's like yes it is like a yes like theater but and didn't but you do there's, that as well i did that as, i did do that as well Office so there's also in a theater isn't it it is also in a theater so i could mm. apply if you use all of that into it um i also think there's something about sport like my favorite thing my coach ever told me was like focus on your own lane like do you know how much time it takes to turn and look left i run 100 meters guys so it's like do you know how much time it takes to look to your left or your right it takes a tenth of a second to look left mm. or right and that's enough time to decide first and last place mm. and it's like just stay focus on your own race and it's like that commitment like i'm not even looking at anybody else sorry you know no shade but it's like i'm just really focused on what i'm doing mm -hmm. i am doing um and i think that is important 
um, and playing sports. Um, and then what was the other question? Sorry. Well, I'm just thinking like you're doing all these things because it sounds like, you know, all, I'm fusing all of these things together to kind of see like team dynamics kind of helps in theater. It helps on a set. Oh, right? for sure. As well. And then you're talking about stories and the stories that we've told ourselves, you know, as a country that are based on lies. But you are playing characters, you know, in which those stories are humanizing people mm -hmm, that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. have had lies told about them, right? Like, yes. like American prisoners or someone like Shirley Chisholm, what I would say, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, I think doing those two things at the same time, I think particularly maybe being in opera and like having no examples when I was doing that, save like the Jesse Normans, the Leontine Prices, these great, great people that I had to go and find and discover and see like their power and, and uh, phen the phenomenal space they held. I think it did make me purposeful in some way in my choosing because I very early came to understand the wide expanse of blackness that this mm. single idea of who that I'm seeing on the seven o'clock news or when I'm a kid watching entertainment and the, the, the narrow way that we're being portrayed is not our truth. I would even layer that in just in put into my I'm first gen American. My family's yes. from Nigeria. You know, layer I would layer that into it too. Being coming gone and seeing a place where I am seeing an array of who we are, hearing my mother say, you know, I didn't know there was anything wrong with being black until I moved to America. Mm -hmm. You know, right. I said, What do you mean? And she said, you know, in Nigeria, your president is black, your poorest person is black, the richest person is black, your teacher is black, your lawyer is black, your doctor is black. So this idea that we can only do one thing is just so foreign to me, you know? And just seeing that, I think that drew me to wanting to tell interesting, diverse, nuanced stories that have more than what either sometimes the page might offer or more than what the what the world might think we can offer. I, th I think it's very clear, especially listening to you speak, you're a person that is very thoughtful, you have a lot of empathy, you have a lot of compassion, and ev I think everybody can agree that you bring that to characters that you play in an amazing way. Uh, and I'm wondering in this moment that we're all living through, how challenging it must be to have all that thoughtfulness, empathy, and compassion and be feeling all of our outrage, feeling all of our pain, and to have to navigate an industry that is like like the industry around your craft, which mm -hmm. is really white and really capitalistic and doesn't mm -hmm. really make a lot of space for mm -hmm. the things that we're processing. I'm, I'm wondering how it is that you navigate that and, and if you have any advice for other people who are in a similar position. Well, I mean, I'm a work in progress every day, learning every day. Um, but I think for me, it has always been, it was such a long road, Mike, getting to full self-acceptance, mm. loving my gap, loving everything about myself. You know, I'm not saying there's no every, you know, days where it's like, oh, I wish this, that, whatever it is it might be. But it's like really accepting and seeing myself and knowing myself as being enough, right? Full stop. Um, that I can't be s s wooed into thinking I need to do something differently outside of myself. Um to fit in or find proximity to something I will never possess, never mm. be. Doesn't matter how hard you work, want, desire. I don't want work or, want or desire any of those things, but that, nar that idea being sent to you, it takes standing in that and, and knowing that that isn't really truly is enough. You know, and not being trying to shift or do anything in that like that and realizing that that is, you know, my superpower. But I think also more important right now, realizing that that actually is my activism. Mm. And that is how things progress, things mm. move that someone like myself 
who felt invisible when I would watch TV or go to the movies growing up, that the, the most powerful thing that I could do is hold on to myself and exist in spaces and fight for spaces different from where I'm normally kept. Mm -hmm. So that, so that the young lady behind me or the actress standing beside me can think differently. I would mm. encourage that. And I think I feel hopeful. Why I say I feel hopeful is it's like this next generation who is out here marching, voting with their dollars and speaking up, whether the industry wants to join willingly or whether they come kicking and screaming, this industry's hand will be forced to change because the demand, the market's demand has changed mm -hmm. and these young people they vote with their money they don't just vote in november they vote with right. their money now and that's a game changer wow you sound like changer. a person who would be perfect to play someone like shirley chisholm um, <laughs> because i think what you're talking about is what when people say self-realization when i hear people talk about that i think that what you said there is a perfect example of of what that looks like, you know, in mm. that standing in one's self-love, you know, and stuff like that. That's pretty incredible. And that that trend that makes me want to transition into um, what what must what it must have been like to play Shirley Chisholm and to think about who she is because, you know, again, like you were just saying, I feel like Shirley Chisholm set a a, a standard and a bar that you know she was so visible in a way where a lot of women after her were like that was an influence on them that was somebody that they needed to see there to know that they could be there as well so i guess i wanted to talk to you about lessons learned from examining and playing shirley chisholm yeah i mean it was it was really dope honestly it was awesome it was awesome it was awesome and it it was an like not even trying to be, you know, whatever. It was really, truly an honor. Um, it was the, the, the best thing that I got out of um, playing that role was understanding that I'm not alone in this fight of feeling like who I think I am and what is possible for me can be different from what the world think is possible for you. And that was what I got out of this woman who's running for president in 1972. She's not running for president, you know, 2016. She's running in a time where she's standing right on the heels of the Civil Rights Voting Act, mm. death of Martin Luther King, death of Malcolm X, Montgomery bus court boycott, March on Selma, what name it, she's, she's in that space, right? And the fact that she's doing it, you realize she is a woman, she is a black woman, she is black in America. And whoever she, she her idea of her own pop, pop, possibility and the definition of who she is, is different of, than what this country is. And therefore, what a might she must be made of, what a strength she has, what a heavy lift that must mm. have been. You know, that's yeah. what I think about. I think about the end of that day. I think about, you know, how she was dressed and the, the wig, she, everything to, see, to be seen, the bold colors she's wearing, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. she's, she's doing those things to be seen in a world that doesn't see her, mm. you know? Um, it has to be that big. Otherwise, you might look right over her. Wow. Hmm. That's fantastic. And speaking of uh, black women who have been looked over, we had actually had a little conversation about this when we were talking about, because you had just mentioned the, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott. And uh, mm -hmm. we were talking about, um, you know, you wanted to kind of talk about women who a lot of people didn't know were out there. And you had mentioned Joanne Robinson. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about Joanne Robinson? Well, Joanne Robinson, you know, was a part of a women's club in Montgomery, you know, like a, a social club. Um, and, she, you know, what people think, I think a lot of times when think about, people think of the Montgomery bus boycott, they often think of Martin Luther King coming in. And they think they think of, 
of course, Rosa Parks. Yeah. And I think people often think that it was an, the Montgomery bus boycott was something that was organized, started by all these historical black male finger figures. When the truth of the matter is, it was a group of women who mm. started it. A group of black women, more specifically, led by one Joanne Robinson. And I think I want everybody in the world to know her name because it's critical. It's critical because I think we look at this time now, mm -hmm. and we're seeing all these amazing voices from Black women, whether it's Opal, whether it's of uh, Black Lives Matter uh, yeah. women, the, the whether it's uh, Tamika Mallory. You know, we're hearing all these names, thinking that this is the first time that Black women have swept in and saved the day when it's not. It's just <laughs> not, when, when it's not. It's yeah. been an erasure in history. There's an erasure that's happened, um, and yeah, that's why I try and say her name from the mountain. Top. And one of my favorite movies of all time is an HBO original film called Boycott, uh, in which Jeffrey mm -hmm. Wright played Martin Luther King Jr. Yep. and Joanne Robinson was, was played by CCH Pounder. Who I love. You were talking about CCH. What did you say? I said, Who I love, sidebar. Yes. One of the uh, best well, in, the business, in the game. We'll talk, we'll talk about her real quick, about yeah. CCH. CCH, brilliant actor, effortless performances, time and time again, has such a command of space. Mm. and like internal story she can say she could lit she can literally have no lines <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh i've seen that a look a turn a mm -hmm. no you're line like, you're with it you're with it yes yes and it will grab you and at the same time make your internal self sob like it's mm. she 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 can she can do that she is a force but then there's also like this supreme delicacy there um that she's the supreme she, delicacy. she yeah like the intention that force and that strength is not me meant to she can break you but she could also hug you oh stop her before i fall apart <laughs> <laughs> well seems we have another guest <laughs> holy shit sorry <laughs> yes Oh, oh my god. My airbun fell out. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Oh, holy <laughs> sorry for swearing. Well, not, not, not that there's a need of formality at this point, but let's yeah. uh let's let's I introduce to the you. show. You are amazing. CCH Pounder, the one and only. Amazing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> sorry. Y'all talk. Y'all talk. I want You I are amazing. A force, a leader. This is you guys, I mean, you know already. Like, I just want to jump back. Pave the wave. Thank you. Paving and pave. Ugh. Ugh. I just want to jump back to Shirley Chisholm in my real life, just for a moment, you guys, because Please. I was around when she wanted to do that. I was in America and Whoa. I was working for a now defunct youth in action, hmm. heavily male, black male. Yes. And I remember. Shirley speaking, and they were just so ridiculously insulting. Our mm. community was so mm. ridiculous. Oh, our community. About the fact that she was a woman, that oh, yes. type of black woman. If maybe if she were a beauty, they yeah, would yeah. have something to latch on to. Well, at least, you know, I'm going to vote for the good looking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, they mm -hmm, were mm -hmm. ridiculous. And I remember being in that room with that group of men and I was completely invisible. Mm -hmm. I was a, um, a summer intern and I was never, I certainly was not seen. And I remember looking at that woman and wondering how she was pulling it off because mm -hmm. he had grit. She had a sense of purpose. She was tiny. And I was like, you've got to be kidding. I never forgot her. And in the uh, late early 80s, I wanted to do a film. I can't tell you how excited that she actually got done because of those days they told me, you got to be kidding. Mm. Shirley, you want to do a, a movie about Shirley? Never happened. Not. And you've proved otherwise. So thank you. I'm talking lineage. Yeah. yeah. I'm talking yeah. connection. Oh, call and response. We <laughs> like to shower people with the affection. 
Oh, CCH Pounder. <laughs> what are we doing? Ooh, yeah. Oh, do yeah. yeah. There was love and performance, and I gotta prove ya. Prove ya. All right. Not prove okay. ya. I gotta prove ya. I was searching for a rhyme. I'm so sorry. You are a dream. Um, we're gonna cut to a quick break, and when we come back, we're gonna be back wow. with both CCH Pounder and Uzo Aduba. Excuse us. My brain is like. With Uzo Aduba and CCH Pounder, uh, we just had a little bit of a surprise. Uh, how, what you think about that whole surprise situation, Mike? <laughs> I thought it was amazing. You, uh, you're like a mad scientist of joy. <laughs> <laughs> it's alive we're finally all alive um so anyway i wanted to I, I you know i didn't know if you had met each other or anything like that um but i wanted to be able to surprise my friend uzo with someone we're both fans of you know i would assume i don't want to talk for mike but i think he's also a fan of yours as well absolutely uh, so yeah i just wanted to be able to uh kind of you know meet as a community and say hello and uh, let y'all talk to each other. You know, do you have questions for each other? I yield the platform to these two. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. O only because it's it's wonderful to actually communicate with um, like when we're so often like an individual person in one one of us somewhere around. And so yeah. it takes moments like, like I was talking about Alfre's uh, sisters that mm we can actually get in a room and have a conversation. Yeah. And how on earth did Shirley Chisholm come into your life? Mm. And how did it get the go ahead to go? Mm. <laughs> um, the, it came to me, my, my agents actually came, came to me, you depart, yes? The part came, mm -hmm. um, my agents came to me and said that they were making <clears throat> a uh, limited series called Mrs. America and um, with Kate Blanchett. And, they, and I was like, I love Kate Blanchett. And so they said, you know, the part of um, Shirley Chisholm is one that they're interested in uh, having you play. And I said, okay, cool. And so I did, I actually did like this, you know, um, a FaceTime um, with the team, with Davi, with Stacy, with, um, Carmen and uh, our casting director and producer and the creator and we were just we we were just talking um, politics and the world and mm -hmm. all of these women are um, incredibly smart you know incredibly strong and worldly and we were just having all of these conversations about it and then um, they had me were they talking to other people at this time or do you, do you that know? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Um, so you were know. there and you were kind of like, they were like, well, what do you think about Shirley? Yeah. And I was like sharing, I had read this book. Um, when, it, when we first moved to New York, Baron, I had bought this book called The African American Century. I think, it's, you know, we've talked about it before. Mm -hmm. And that was when I had um, read about her. Like it's a, every chapter section has like a historical monumental figure in history um, from 1999. And so she was in there and I knew about her and was moved by her. My mom was a big Shirley Chisholm fan and I'd heard her name in the house growing up a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so then, yeah, I just read for the part. I got um, some sides material. I put it on tape and you're, said, you're, this I, is... I feel like you're under, undercutting it a little bit. You're being very, you're being very humble. I mean, obviously you booked the part, but I yeah. guess I'm, I'm curious, not to be loved. <laughs> about what the qualities that you were like, all right, these are the things that I'm going to, I'm going to, these are my Chisholm tricks. <laughs> <laughs> my Chisholm tricks. Well, the hair. Um, but I mean, other than that, I, my real thing was um, I had watched the documentary on her. Have you seen the documentary Unbossed? Um, unbought, and, unbought and Unbossed by her. If you haven't, you guys should check it out. It's really incredible. And the thing that I was really interested in hanging my hat on was like the last 10 minutes there was one scene of her dancing and it was this lightness in her lightness in her mm. that was such a direct mm. counterpoint to the woman we we're always seeing giving yeah. speeches and having to be the face and she was those things but there was this buoyancy and mm. almost like 
youthfulness in her that I had never seen before. And then the real thing for me was the last 10 minutes of the doc when she's getting ready to release her delegates and she's backstage at the DNC and she just folds into her hands mm. and starts crying. And the cry isn't, it was so big, you guys. And mm. I don't mean in terms of sound, it was bigger than just the one thing. Right. It was the slog mm -hmm. that you were hearing, I felt anyway, in the weight of the whole thing. And that was the first time I felt like I was seeing Shirley Chisholm, not the woman who had to meet the world with her exceptionalism, but the woman we see when she goes home and she takes off the hair and she takes off the bold clothes and she's there with everything that's been thrown at her that day. That was the story I was interested in telling. That woman's story. Fantastic. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For me, did CC, did you get what you wanted? I did. I yes. did. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Go ahead. Can I ask a question? Oh. Sorry. This might be a heavy lift, mm. but do you know how many lives you've changed? Mm. <laughs> oh, a light, a light question. Okay, oh yeah, 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 something like. But I mean that really yeah, sincerely. In the weirdest way, because I, I know it, it sounds so like, well, yes, I do. So. <clears throat> but there is, there is a particular film in my life, uh, Baghdad Cafe, oh, that yeah. changed the lives of a lot of people. On, I only know it because they found me and wrote to me. Mm. And I mean, changed their lives in the sense of life, not mm. just they decided to do that, but mm. it gave them life. And the strangest things come from the most ordinary little places. And mm. Baghdad is not a particularly big film. It's mm. had a life of its own that's crept along for years, mm -hmm. changing mm -hmm. people's lives. And I was just, now that you bring it up, like amazed that, wow, she was a rather ordinary woman. Floyd was a rather ordinary man, little mm -hmm. flaws here and there, nothing spectacular. But he has now changed how we're going to do things worldwide. Mm -hmm. It's that huge. And sometimes it's, it's not the great man that mm -hmm. does it, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. the huge leader that does it. It's us little rats in the, down there scurrying to make a living and doing this and that. And something just happens to us one day. Mm. And that's it. I fought for Baghdad. It was mm. an unknown film, German director. It was foreign and they laid all those things on me. There's no money. There's, it's a foreign film. I don't, what? And I said, have you ever given me a role that is anything that looks like this, that I could have a character from beginning to end and um, that it shut them up. And I insisted mm. on it. And yes, there was no money, but the, the payback was in spades like you wouldn't believe, mm. just in terms of life-changing moments. So every now and again, I just wish that everyone gets something that magical because a lot of this is just work. We're working mm. actors. A lot mm. of it's just work. But every now and again, you get to an art place that can transform lives and mm. Mm -hmm. on all of us. Well, you wow. are, you know, I have a term for people that I, you are an elevator because you mm. lift so many people up, you, you know, so thank you. Thank you. Well, Miss Uzo, unfortunately, we're going to uh, say goodbye to you, but I yes. wanted to ask you something really quick before we let you go, which I think is a really mm -hmm. important question that uh, we often don't get to ask, ask actors and actresses. Uh, we're in a moment where people are putting a lot of spotlight on black talent, black creativity, black creators all over the spectrum. And for a musician, it's easy to just post a link to an album. For a visual artist, it's easy to just post pictures of the work and say where you can find it. Um, for an actor or an actress, what is the best way to support you? 
um is it just watching the work or are there other ways that we don't necessarily think of in front of, of mind that are best ways to support uzo aduba um i don't have a a a, a, a short sweet 30 sure. second answer but sure. i think what i what i can say that i think is um would be a way to 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 support not just me but i think all the people who look like me or who have had a single um a single pathway um i would say that what would be how you can support is when 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 folks like myself or the jody smith or uh the the lupitas or the denies and, and all the way out and as far as the expanse can see. Um, when we venture into spaces that we aren't normally thought of existing in, holding, go see those projects. The okay. Michaela Coles, right? Like go see and support those things. And, and, and imagine, imagine Imagine that individual in that place that they've never held before. Imagine a Michaela as a Julia Roberts, because that's real. That's possible. Dream bigger. I guess that would be the thing that I would say. Support all of those women. Support all of those voices. And men, too. You know, when those scripts are, don't don't be narrow in uh, in your in your vision for us. Thank you so much for that. Yes, indeed. And uh, uh, the host version of Baron Vaughn uh, wants to say, and please support Uzo by watching Mrs. America on, <laughs> on Hulu, FX. FX on Hulu. Yeah. FX on Hulu in her depiction of Shirley Chisholm. Uzo, thank you very much for being here. And uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you. This made my day. My day. Bye, Uzo. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye. Take care. And now we get to roll into a, uh, a, a, a lovely conversation with Miss CCH Pounder. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Oh, it's been wonderful. It's, uh, I'm so glad I watched it from the very beginning. And I just have to compliment you on that wonderful arc and variety of inclusiveness that this program had today. Oh, why, thank you. Oh, so glad we're, we're getting to that place. I'm so glad we're, we're making it. Yeah. Uh, Mike. What do you want to ask? <laughs> I'm a really um, good interviewer. I just ask my co-host. <laughs> uh, say something, Mike. You, you, you smart. We, we spoke to uh, Ernie Hudson last week. And he, in, in talking about his career, talked about um, a long history of not, get, like, especially when he started, he didn't get roles that were very fleshed out. And he mm -hmm. talked about how he had to do a lot of work to do, as he called, bringing humanity uh, to characters. And I wanted to ask you, is there is there a specific thought or process you have of bringing a spirit of, of protest and defiance to your work when it's not always there on the page? It's a great question. But first of all, I came from the theater. Mm -hmm. So there is a sort of tradition of this is your bit, you're on, you're off. And there's a kind of a satisfaction of having delivered. So yeah, yeah. I am a deliverer, mm. regardless of whether it's one line. And I don't mean because it's one line, it's like, this is my line! <laughs> I don't mean that. However, I am going to write something where I want you to come in and say that exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a a wonderful time of fitting in, which I think is really important. And um, I did a, a film with Mike Nichols, I'm Dancing As Fast As I Can, it's Meryl Streep. Um, uh, Mike Nichols directing Meryl Streep was the lead. And on the very first day of film, we were all there. Even the person who was like the taxi guy that said, yeah, my dad. And it put everything in perspective for me for the first time for film that this is how you fit. So mm -hmm. that when you went home and, you know, two months later when they finally call you and it's like, this is what you're going to do, you're not like, 
I'm practicing for my life. <laughs> or you know that you, you're just a small cog in the wheel of this giant machinery that tells this story. And so I've always had that. But within the confines of that and within the confines of um, you were especially chosen, perhaps because you're black. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's just not enough to be the nurse with, um, you know, doctor, I think he's having a heart attack. Sometimes there's something as simple as, doctor, I think he's having a heart attack. It's, it's the urgency which, which we give life for that makes people, you, you get a feeling. Mm. And I don't know whether it's germane to me or whether this is part of the black experience that you bring all of these things unconscious or conscious with you. But there is a kind of intensity that I don't seem to want to give up. Mm. And I'll give you a perfect example that I've had recently where I was reading a story with the kind of intensity that I was experiencing from it. And the young lady who was British said, it's quite lovely. Um, could you um, perhaps sort of lighten it up a bit? <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm sorry. Is this for a white audience? Oh. And she said, well, yes, yeah, sort of. And I said, okay, well then this is what you actually want. So I did it and I sent it in and they ended up going with mine, <laughs> but with my version, but it's sometimes really important that you, you understand that the level of emotionality in actors of color is an essential and important thing as opposed to like, oh God, it's too much, back mm. on. This is who we are and this is who I'm selling. Mm. Wow, that's that is fantastic. I feel like from from myself, that's always been like a, a weird thing in my career as an actor. Um, I I'm classically trained, blah blah blah, right. and right. I work, but I have brought sometimes a level of intensity to things that I think sometimes turns people off. And I'm not saying that I haven't been demonstrative. Of course, I have been, um, but you know, when I bring the who I think the human is. You know, it's always about like minimizing the things that I think would make this character, you know, work or or be real, I guess. And I, you know, I always give people what they want, but I always feel like I'm I'm being asked to not even as simply as no, don't be so big. That's a different thing. But there's like a level of intensity or presence that I sometimes feel like it's making someone else uncomfortable. And that's why I'm being asked not to do that. Does that make any sense? It absolutely does. Um, my friend would say, people are going to tell you, don't be so uh, black, mm. a little too black. Um, and they'll try to, other words to work around that, whatever that means. It actually to me means uh, sometimes specifically black American sometimes, mm. uh, because uh, there's an expectation of an attitude that uh, is not everyone's, but it's what other people somehow recognize. It's like, okay, that, that's what creates character. And uh, so there are a lot of these very surface people, a lot, a lot of very sort of surface uh, presentations that are um, far shallower than I, I would want to give out. And at this spectacular age that I've arrived at, where all of you are my children, I am not really <laughs> interested in delivering uh, a character that is um, so wet. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Well, Mike, you're going to ask something. Well, you know, I know the original um, top line of this episode was protesting through art, yes. and you had uh, submitted to us some art that's moved you recently from a man named Patrick. Waldemar, and I believe we have some of his images to show, but um, I wanted you to describe, if you will, uh, why his work, specifically this recent work, uh, resonates with you. Okay, and, and it's really more 
why an artist, and it's any artist, mm -hmm. finds themselves in a situation like we all are now with COVID, with the protests, with Black Lives Matter, with um, the statues coming down or not coming down, with the sense of there is a pressing and urgent need for change and much of it is quite ugly out there. And um, here I was with an artist who happened to be doing a new series on the courtyards of New Orleans. Beautiful subject and they're fantastic courtyards here. And I was particularly interested in them because the wrought ironwork that he had implement has introduced into the paintings have a lot to do with blacksmiths who are black people. Mm. So the Haitians, the Africans who came and had this Smith knowledge and made these beautiful renditions. But the problem is he was watching television at the same time in the background and this endless barrage of murder, mayhem, protest, burning, and uh, a, a head of state that had so little idea of what to do and how to implement anything that was positive for the rest of his people. And he couldn't tolerate simply painting a beautiful photograph. And he was so influenced by Floyd's murder that it kept coming into the paintings. And this is what I want to show you, that even as artists, we cannot sit idly by, um, even if a beautiful thing is due to a gallery, here is what is happening in my brain mm. right now. And so maybe we can show the photographs now. I believe we are yeah. showing them. Yeah, we are. That's you are showing them, okay. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was enthralled of the fact that it's in every part of artistry. The poetry is different now. People are writing um, uplifting but demanding works of, uh, of words, works of words, I, I'll say. Um, people are painting differently. If you can watch on uh, Instagram, how many images there are of Floyd in every kind of situation being honored, being the truth, we're trying to tell the visual truth of it, um, songs that are coming out. And so we're influenced by this and sometimes we're the leaders of how to get people motivated to the next step. So if it's if you see something or you've heard something or you hear a song and it tells you, I'm gonna go vote this time. Mm. If it gets your butt up and you become part of the collective force that will make a change, then I am interested in sharing that with the world. That's awesome. Incredible. Um, we wanted to ask you a little bit about um, some other visual artists, uh, you know, because we, you know, Mike has a visual artist. Um, well, I, I love this visual artist too, but I, I became aware of her work because of because of Mike uh, appreciating her work. Um, mm -hmm. You want to you want to bring her up, Mike? Oh, I'm assuming we're talking about Carol Walker. Yes, indeed. Um, she works often in in brilliant silhouettes that appear almost childlike or mm -hmm. or cartoonish and fantastical but if you really look at them very closely um there's a lot of painful depictions especially of of uh black american history that we don't often uh speak about mm -hmm. especially not to children uh so there's a there's an innocence to her work but there's a realness to her work I believe we're we're showing uh some of it right now yeah i'm trying to see if we can get uh get some yeah, to Oh, you can see it? Yeah, CC? Oh, I can see oh, okay. it. Okay, all right, cool. Yeah. yeah, and this is some of the, her, her sculpture, I think, here. Right, yeah. I, I never got a chance to actually see any of the large-scale sculptures. A lot of that stuff was uh, was in New York a few years ago on display. Um, I've seen stuff of hers that's on museums, and a lot of that is the um, the silhouette work that's kind of yeah. on flat plane. I, I call it the black and white nightmare stories. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, they're they're really powerful, yes. and um, and you know I have another really I've met Carol by the oh, way. Oh, that's beautiful. Very briefly met her um, here in New Orleans, um, where she had a huge installation on the banks of the Mississippi, um, mm. with the what I call the hurdy gurdy machine, 
um, and then they also played themselves. And um, they used the, the music that the riverboat plays. Um, hmm. the, the word will come to me, the, the instrument will come to me uh, in, in a second. Um, calliope. Mm -hmm. So um, that sound was playing as well. And very interesting. She stirs up a lot of emotions, yeah. in, particularly in older African-American um, artists. For instance, Betty Starr and her had quite a, a powerful argument because wow. Betty was trying to eliminate these kind of uh, images in the sense of... Um, she, she found them cruel and debasing. Mm. And yet, comparison with her, she also used like the Aunt Jemima images, mm. um, Aunt Jemima with a, a rifle, um, the, the liberation of Aunt Jemima is one of her great uh, pieces that somehow in the contrast of each other's conversations, uh, it was very hard for them to come together. Mm. And... Uh, in the end, they sort of agreed to disagree. And I think mm. there was room for all of those ideas. And that's probably why I'm going to bring back Shy again. Um, uh. There has to be room for a lot of ideas. Yes, yes. That's all part of our history, our story, our becoming. And no one is entitled to be left out. You Which know, brings no me... Oh, I'm sorry, say that again? No, I'm just going to say we don't have the privilege of leaving people out. Absolutely, absolutely. Which brings me to uh, my next question. I, I think it might be our final question, even. Uh -huh. um, you know, I guess the theme today, uh, in some ways, whether intentional or unintentional, is, for lack of a better term, multiculturalism. In the sense of not even just the cultures of that we all belong to, whether it be hip hop, comedy, acting, actual visual art, sculpture, um, ballroom, kiki, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but also nationality. Um, yourself, you were born in a different country. Um, mm -hmm. Our friend Uzo is a first generation uh, American. Her, her parents are from Nigeria. And you live in New Orleans, which is a very multicultural um, city. Uh, with a very multicultural history. And I guess I wanted to ask you about the synergy of all of those things in terms of the images that are that you're seeing out there today, in terms of all of this art, and just even like mainstream movies, television, more and more discussions about things like Afrofuturism and things like yes. that. It's, an, it's a, a, an essential moment in our lives, actually. Mm. So we're in a bizarre decade because I think we've actually been quite insular. African-American, we're talking about, you know, our fathers, the heritage was slavers and uh, ex-slaves and so on. And then there are the, the new Africans coming in. Um, they're immigrant Africans. Mm -hmm. Then they're the upwardly mobile. They're the oh no, we don't do things like that. And, oh no, don't do that in your actions. There, there's so many different aspects of us that we have to accept before we even step out so that we can actually put our link arm in arm and say, this is who we are. Hmm. Because Shelley was absolutely right. It's very difficult for the other to embrace what they're doing or what those people are doing. It's very difficult. And we've had a hard time accepting all these various aspects of ourselves. And that's the point that we, we never want to say, ourselves, it's who mm. we are collectively. We're all these people. And it's very tough for us. And gotta get used to it, baby. Gotta understand the fluidity of our lives. We're fluid, and there's a whole bunch of different kinds of us, and us ourselves have to take a look at us before we even step out there as a collective group of people and say, this is who we are.
that's amazing and i think um you can hear the essential wisdom of it and it also tied into something that uzo said about how she's able to navigate an industry that doesn't make the space for the emotions that we're often trying to process she had to accept things about herself to be able to move forward and take up space and it's it, it's amazing that it's tied so brilliantly into what you're saying about us as a people having to accept everything about ourselves so that we can take up the space that we need to take up in society you know alfrey water gave me a great lesson one time she said look at this face i'm gonna take this face and i'm gonna shove it down their throats <laughs> you're gonna love it we have to do the same thing for ourselves take all those different parts of us drink it up and love it it's bitter it's sweet it's ugly it's gorgeous it's all those things you got to take the whole gumbo now that i'm done at new orleans i can say <laughs> but yeah well it's everybody great. whole gumbo uh, thank you very much cch pounder for being here um oh my goodness what an honor what a great fantastic talk today um any shout outs that you want to give or things you want to point people toward just because you love them yourself or want to support oh that's awesome well first of all i know that we are doing a, a little bit of focusing on black owned businesses and so on and i certainly want to mention the stella jones gallery here in new orleans back in los angeles i want to mention the terrell tilford band of vices gallery i'm very art oriented as you can see clearly uh, yes so <laughs> uh up in new york city you know there is the uh, corridor gallery uh danny simmons so take a look around and see who you can support in the venues that you love even if it's gardening even if it's birding like mr cooper hmm. take a look around fantastic advice all right thank you very much See thank you for pounder. being here thank you for yes. your wisdom your gravity and your grace we appreciate you so much thank you you could be my son. I just love you. <laughs> I love you back. That's lovely. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Oh my goodness, Mike! Bye. What a, what an episode! I got a new mom. Yes, yes you did. did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye bye. All right. Now. Bye. Oh goodness. Um. Well, I mean, I guess the theme is support each other. It right? is. In it all is. of our different forms and shapes, straight black dudes, stop being weird. Yeah, don't be <laughs> homophobic. Don't be transphobic. You know? Homophobia is just done. It's over. Come on. We got a ways to go, though, before we get there, though, really. Because, like, you know, you know the kind of conversations we have to have with our own brothers to actually get to that point. Because, you know, right. we got a long line of it. You it know, it's up to us. Yeah. But you got to support queer people. You got to support trans people. You got to support. OK, mm -hmm. they're us. We are them. The end. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, shit, this is Friday. Um, our penultimate episode. We got one last episode. We got one more to go. Wow. This was long, and I hope you guys will forgive us for that. But I think that we, we, we pulled our weight <laughs> yeah. on this long episode. And, and you know, please, please tell everybody. Um, so, <laughs> this Monday will be our final episode of Call and Response. That is going to be a great episode, Mike. Absolutely. We have Deepa Iyer, a uh, fantastic um, lawyer, thinker, so many, so many titles. She's, uh, she's, she's provided some brilliant material for us to think about the ways that we can fit into this, to these protests and all the different roles that are available to us. Uh, we have our good friend Janelle James, uh, the comic, and uh, we speak to brother Hanif Abdurraqib, who is a, a brilliant writer and author and we get to chop it up with all of them yeah we're just going to be kind of talking about all the all the different things there are to do to promote social change and how you can participate in all these many ways that you might have not thought of um so i guess that's it for us right mike yeah we want to give a shout out to funny or die and a shout out to blavity uh for lending us their platforms but yeah man it's another great one play your part on monday and today protest with art and if you eat lots of beans no please don't what just don't do it